Last January, another congregation invited me to preach on Sunday, April 22nd. Now, back in January, I hadn't focused on the fact that April 22nd was on a Sunday, so I declined. And later that day, when I got up with my husband, Ted, I said, you know, our 40th wedding anniversary is on a Sunday this year. You know, what do you want to do to celebrate? You want to go away for the weekend? And Ted said, well, no, I, I want to be at worship at home church. So several weeks after that, when Jenny asked me to preach this Sunday, I said, well, as a matter of fact, I was planning on being on church that Sunday. So, <laughs> And at least, Ted, we get to sit a little closer together than we normally do. And uh, as he said, and I have your back today. So. Please join with me in praying responsibly uh, the appointed psalm for the day, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life. Today's psalm is perhaps the best known and most beloved declaration of faith in the Western world, read and prayed by Jews and Christians alike. When we are anxious or upset, the psalm gives us courage and peace. When we are grieving, it offers us comfort. When we are overwhelmed by how badly other people treat us, the psalm teaches us how to deal with it. Even if we can't recite the whole psalm perfectly, many of us know it well enough to recognize it and pray along in a funeral or worship service, much like we sing along to the Star Spangled Banner at a sporting event. In just 57 Hebrew words, the psalm proclaims the experience of generation after generation of believers, showing us a way of understanding the world we live in teaching us how to recognize the presence of God at times and in places when it feels like God is absent. Are those events in our lives when we are so caught up with our own worries that we overlook God's presence with us in the midst of our troubles? The primary message of the 23rd Psalm it's not that bad things will never happen to us, no matter how good or careful we are, but rather the primary message of the 23rd Psalm is we will never have to face those bad and painful times alone, for thou art with me. From the words of the Psalm, we can infer that the Psalmist did not have a pain or problem-free life. He had enemies that confronted him. He experienced being in the pit, in the dark and depressing times of life, yet he praises and thanks God for all that God has done for him, not because his life has been easy, but precisely because his life is hard and God has seen him through hard times. The 23rd Psalm gives us a lens for seeing and responding to what happens in our lives in the way God desires that we see and respond. Much of the time, we cannot control what happens to us, but we can always control how we respond to what happens to us. Now, one could preach several sermons on any of the declarations in the Psalm and the one I'm particularly focused on today is at the end of verse 5. My cup overflows. Now, overflowing cups is contrary to what the powers of this world tell us. They tell us the proverbial cup is never full. Pessimists say the cup is half empty. Optimists declare the cup is half full. It's never 
overflowing. Life can always be better, says the pessimist. There's always room for improvement, responds the optimist. But this is not what the psalmist tells us. The psalmist tells us to look at our lives as an overflowing cup of God's gift to us of life. The essence of a gift is that it comes to you from someone else and not by your own efforts. All of our lives, our births, are given as a gift from God. And once we begin to see our lives in the world through the lens of the 23rd Psalm, the way God would have us see our lives in the world, then we begin to cultivate a grateful heart that sees the blessings in our lives rather than taking what we have for granted. There's a line in a G.K. Chesterton Christmas essay that illustrates this point. He writes, children are delighted when Santa puts toys and sweets in their stockings. Shall I not be grateful when God puts in my stockings the gift of two healthy legs? To see our lives as an overflowing abundance of good gifts from a gracious and loving God also makes us happier and improves the quality of our lives. Lynn Babb, a Presbyterian minister, writes in her essay, Gratitude as a Spiritual Discipline, that for years her prayer time with her husband focused on the needs of their family, their friends, and the world. They had two challenging teenage sons. Her husband was experiencing job frustration and stress. She was still in a discernment mode after graduating from seminary. Focusing on all the needs was discouraging and often Lynn and her husband felt more depressed and discouraged when they finished praying, having been reminded anew of all their problems, concerns, and needs. She writes, we felt stuck in a rut of discouragement, negativity, and powerlessness. But somewhere in their praying, they decided what Lynn calls a small change. She and her husband began each prayer time with a few prayers of thankfulness. At first, she writes, the best we could come up with were prayers like, thanks for helping us make it through today, or thanks for helping us to, to survive an argument with our son. But as time went by, Lynn and her husband began to actively look for things to thank God for, each other, the good moments with their sons, food on the table, the flowers and trees they passed, a breeze on a hot summer's day, a change in the weather. Why is it so hard to be grateful when there is so much to be grateful about? Why do we take so many of the gifts God has given us for granted not even noticing them, and focus our attention instead on what we lack or how something doesn't measure up to our standard of perfection. Well, one reason, of course, is our consumer culture, which constantly bombards us with you need, you need, you need, playing into our sinful and selfish nature of I want, I want, I want. I want to feel better about myself. I want to experience what this product claims, so I need this, and then this, and then this. We have a hard time accepting the reality that when we buy into this siren call of our consumer culture, we are all trying to fill a cup that has no bottom. Not the cup of our God-given life but the cup of our false desires that can never make us anything but fleetingly content and happy. Another reason it's so hard to live a life of gratitude and thankfulness is our culture teaches us to be self-sufficient and independent, to need anything we can't get for ourselves or to be dependent on anybody is a sign we haven't made it yet by society's standards. So instead of moving through our lives each day with a sense of gratefulness on the lookout for the gifts God sends us each and every day, 
thankful for what we have. Instead, we focus on getting what we've earned, our fair share, what we deserve because of who we are or what we've done, not realizing that these are all ways of trying to fill a cup that has no bottom. I encourage you to end your day, every day, listing either in your mind or on a piece of paper what you are grateful for in receiving and receiving in being a part of your day. Ask God to help you notice the blessings sent your way that day, what you're thankful for. Ask God for eyes to see and ears to hear the blessings God has in store for you tomorrow. And if you keep this up, I guarantee that like the psalmist, like Lynn Babb and her husband, you will find that even in the midst of hard times and sorrow, your cup overflows. For our ability to recognize, enjoy, and be thankful for God's blessings is more a function of the size of our cup, our capacity to receive God's gifts than any limitation on God's ability or willingness to bless us. The more blessings we are capable of recognizing and accepting, the larger our cup becomes, and the more we will be blessed by God. And the cup of our life will always be overflowing. <laughs>